Okay, welcome everybody to ARCI's video meet number 19. It's hard to believe we've done 19 of these, and uh, but here we are. So I'd like to put out a nice welcome to everybody that's attending today, AIRC members and all the other club members that are here. It's great to have people from all over the country participating in this. And uh, I want to point out right there that we have three more meetings this year. We, we've decided to take the summer off. So if you want to be a presenter, those are your chances to be a presenter this year. So uh, we have a reduced schedule because of all the other activities we have. And if you have any feedback or comments or want to participate, send us an email to that email address right there. And you know, please consider being a, a participant or even just doing a show and tell. Those are real quick and easy. Um, Protocol is pretty simple. Uh, stay on mute if you're not asking a question or being a presenter. And uh, the, uh, the rest is just participation. So there's our agenda for today. I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Matt right here, and he's going to tell us about YouTube. Good morning. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you if you want to do a show and tell today uh, in a poll. So get your Zoom pencils ready. But um, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces on our Archie online meet. It's easy to forget that this meeting is being recorded for later publication on YouTube. So a couple things to keep in mind. Anything that you say or show is not only going to be visible to our club members here, but also potentially everyone else on the internet. So you might want to keep personal contact information off the screen and off the air. And the best place to do that is just put it in the chat. Number two, YouTube uh, does a good job of enforcing copyright protection. And one of the tools they use listens for copyrighted music. Well, we fix and restore radios and they play music. So when you're demonstrating a radio, please keep it on a talk station, not a music station. And number three, our favorite MC, Tom Zachek, does a terrific job of trying to keep us on time and on track. And time permitting, periodically, he'll open the floor to questions and comments. Please follow his lead and stay on mute until he opens the floor. Our first presenter is Tom Kleinschmidt. He did an excellent article in the recent Archie newsletter about movie dial radios. And today he's uh, turned that into a presentation. And so I will turn the screen over to Tom and let's enjoy this presentation. Thank yes. you, Mr. Moderator person. Um, so anyway, we're going to chat about uh, movie dial radios, and as uh, Tom mentioned, there's a couple of articles in the last Archie News. There's a link on the front here, but obviously you won't get that link, but I can put it in the, in the chat. Um, but all of you got the Archie News through an email blast as well, so uh, you should have it. So anyway, here is a movie dial set, and uh, first off, let me thank Greg Van Beek, who's on the call here. Uh, a lot of these pictures came from him of his radios as well as some of mine. So the whole movie dial deal here is the images projected on the screen. And unfortunately, digital cameras, because I'm not as sophisticated and he's not either photographer, you know, the hot spot of the bulb tends to wash the, bulb, the, the image out. And, and Greg at the end is going to show us a real one lit up so you can get a better idea. Uh, but uh, what they've got is is the call letters. You can see them in three layers here and the city, like this one, as you can see St. Paul. And then the frequencies are down at the bottom. And uh, me, uh, and how they do that is they have a, a cylinder of 35 millimeter film and they project it through some lenses and some other stuff. And we'll show that in a minute. But first I thought we would take a look at the, uh, at the catalog. Here's the, uh, Montgomery Ward uh, radio catalog for 1938. And you can see this young lady in front of the dial, very similar to the one that, that we just showed. And a little bit of a close up here. Well, it's kind of out of focus, but you can get, you can give a better idea of what the, 
call letters looks like and so on. So uh, there's a lot of neat stuff in this brochure. And uh, if you guys have never been to this worldradiohistory.com website, I really encourage you to go there. There's a lot of magazines that have been scanned in. All the writer schematics are there. The green uh, um, uh, Gernsback schematics are there. Uh, a lot of really useful information. So uh, do take a look at that. And so moving on. Here's the back of that same radio, and here's where you can see the 35 millimeter film cylinder and the light bulb in the middle. And again, the top row here, this is all the call letter stuff we just looked at. Then these are the short wave bands below it. And this cylinder moves up and down when you change the band, so it changes the image on the screen. And uh, so that's kind of the basic mechanics. There's two versions of this system. And here's, there's gonna be a test later. So about on the left side here, you can see from a top view of there's the cylinder and the light bulb. And then there's the lenses and the, and the hood that keeps stray light from getting in and so on. And this is the second version. You can see it's filed in 1937. Here's the original version filed in 1936 and it's actually a folded system you can see that the the uh cylinder is over here but it's also partially enclosed and when you change bands the color of the screen changes which it doesn't do on these so this is kind of the cost reduced one on the left and this is the original one on the right and you'll find obviously the earlier radios have this and the later radios have that or radios they had left over had this however it worked out but you'll find them both ways. And uh, the important thing here is that Wells Gardner created this system and had the patents on it. And Montgomery Ward cut an exclusive deal with Wells Gardner to use this system. So those are the two players and they had themselves locked together to go do this. So here's some, uh, here's some details. These things ran for three years from uh, 36 to 38. There's some overlap into 39 of leftover stuff, but the make the model years. A uh, whole bunch of different tube counts, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 11, I'm sorry, no, no 12 and a 13. But the point being is there is no five tube sets. This was a mid to high end radio. And as I mentioned here, eight tube sets were almost always seven tube sets with a tuning eye. But they had some interesting features as well. You could get optional remote control on some of the bigger consoles. I don't have a picture of that, but there's the notion in that brochure if you want to go take a look at it. Telephone dial tuning became a popular thing with everybody, so they offered a telephone dial tuning version, multiple speakers. A lot of them have motorized tuning. When you push the push button, it actually uses a motor to get to the channel. Uh, the, uh, the FLL series of Wells Gardner, and we'll get into the series number thing later, were chrome-plated chassis. Wells Gardner did a number of radios that were chrome plated in that era because obviously that was the sign of quality with people like Scott and so on. Um, they made uh, rural sets that are mostly six volt vibrator. They had a few that were multi-battery sets. The 32 volt sets were not done in the uh, movie dial, uh, from what I can tell. And then on the AC sets, most of them were obviously 117 volts, 60 cycles, but they also had some that were strappable for higher voltage, 105 to 235, and some were 25 cycles. 25 cycles is what was used in the East Coast of the U.S. initially, and, uh, and you need a bigger transformer because all these are transformer sets. They're not series string sets. So... Here's an important thing to know is that there is a zillion models that I have found so far, 43 movie dial radios, which is this model number, this 62 prefix number here. And But Wells was a smart outfit. They, uh, they used 17 chassis to make 43 radios. And uh, that is really important in the manufacturing world that I came out of because you can quickly change stuff and your costs are better and all that kind of stuff. The other thing is they used the same chassis with a round dial as well as the movie dial. So again, reuse, reuse, reuse is kind of a building block thing. 
And uh, here's a perfect example. The one on the left is Greg's movie dial set, and the one on the right is my pretty Rochi round dial set. These are exactly the same chassis. They're the same. The cabinet is the same, except for how it's cut out in the front. If you look at the, the grill cloth, or the grill, I'm sorry, the wood grill, is the same motif, but modified. So this one has a radius to follow the round dial, and this one is rectilinear to follow the movie dial. But you see all the little elements are all basically the same shape. The knobs are all in the same place. The tuning eye is in the same place. Again, so they started out making a blank, I'll call it, of a, ca of a cabinet and then, uh, and then just customized it for what was going inside. So um, I'm going to spend a little time being a techno geek here talking about part numbers because I, I, I had to do this in order to figure this out and I found it somewhat interesting. So all of Ward's radios in this time period start with a 62 prefix. And so that's, the, that's this number here. And then the, the digits afterwards are the unique model number. So, you know, if you're familiar with the Philco system where it would be like a 39524, 39 is the model year and 524 is the model of the radio. And if they made it in 40, then it would have been 40 and so on. And what Wards did is they had a prefix as for a category, not a year, and then they put in the model number. And I happened to find a Wards catalog online. And so I'm just taking a quick look. Sporting goods were 60 and tires were 64 and electric motors were 83. So they, they had a whole schema uh, of, uh, of how they did their, their prefix numbers. Um, Many of you know Wells Gardner made a lot of radios and Airline was one of Montgomery Ward and Airline brand was their, one of their biggest customers. So in this time frame, you'll find some that are made by Belmont. I've run across any number of those. I haven't run into anything else, but I'm guessing they probably bought them from somebody else as a trial. Uh, the, uh, the other thing was when I was doing this early on, I thought 62 meant that it was the supplier like Wells Gardner. Because if you think of the, of the silver tone model number system, the first three digits is the supplier number. I went down that rat hole for a while until I figured out I was completely on the wrong track. So here's how it is you know, in captivity, as it were. If you go to the catalog, the catalog number has the radio model number embedded in it. So it's this 162C412 out of one of the catalogs is a 62412. I haven't really researched what the one and the C or the P and the A mean here, but I have a feeling they have to do with which season the catalog was and which version and that kind of stuff, but I haven't dug into that. They also used 62 for accessories and parts. So if you bought an aerial, that's a part number for an aerial. And if you bought the spare bulb for the movie dial, that's the part number for the spare bulb of the movie dial. And that's the catalog number again. So obviously, if you had it in the store, it probably wouldn't have the C in the middle of it. And then the really nice thing that they did is that up on top here, you got the model number. Down here, WG is Wells Gardner. Now, you'll see some of these that'll say oh, BR or BRC, and that's Belmont Radio or Belmont Radio Corporation. They never made movie dials, but they have the same format label. So Montgomery Ward put a lot of structure around a lot of this stuff, just like Sears did. It's, we don't necessarily think about how big an operation Wards and Sears was in the world of Amazon, but basically they were the Amazon of their day. So... Uh, the other thing is this number 24, everybody thinks that's a model number. That's this patent list and license list. And I've seen this on metal plates. I've seen it in documentation. It always says WG24 in the corner of this list. And for whatever reason, that list was called 24. But the secret sauce is that is the Wells Gardner model or series number. So a 62321 used a Series A2 Wells Gardner chassis. Now, you also notice on this chassis, they've taken the movie dial mechanism off so you can see where the tubes are. But that's probably also the generic Wells Gardner graphic that you're going to find when you go into the rider manual. Because the whatever dial system they used was an overlay. So you can find this particular radio 
both under Montgomery Ward and Wells Gardner, in almost every case. And I have found in some cases, there's a lot more information from in the Ward's listing than there is in the Wells Gardner listing, but not always. Sometimes it's the same. But I think again, Wells Gardner, I'm sorry, Montgomery Ward was, uh, was, was dictating what they were providing because they probably had some in-house service literature, which I don't have, uh, but uh, that's my theory and I'm sticking to it for now. So Wells Gardner is still in business. In fact, uh, this is from their website, uh, but we'll get to that in a second. As we mentioned, they, they, may, they were a private label uh, set maker, uh, all kinds of store brands, uh, Gamble stores, uh, which were Coronado, and I think they did True Tone, which was uh, Western Auto, and so on and so on. And this A2 chassis we just looked at, or any of the other ones, were, would be used in other brand radios with different dials, different cabinets, and all that kind of stuff. So in the spare parts world, with the exception of the movie dial pieces, you'll be able to find the same chassis in completely different branded radios. And again, they were only made by Wells and only sold by, by Montgomery Ward under the airline brand. But one of the interesting things in that brochure you may have noticed, it said Montgomery Ward on it, it didn't say airline on it anywhere. So they, they had sort of a, of a different branding strategy than what we're used to. Uh, the other thing is you'll find that there are a few radios that have a Wells Gardner brand name on them. And my working theory right now is that those were canceled or excess inventory uh, because there is evidence of radios that didn't sell like the, the big 16 tube set. Uh, that we talked about a few episodes back uh, that got rebranded under different store names. And then there's some out in the world to say Wells Gardner. So anyway, Wells moved from Chicago to Wooddale, Illinois. Wooddale is not too far from you, probably half an hour away. And they make display technology. So it's stuff that's gonna be in, in gaming and video games and signs and kiosks and that kind of stuff. So, if you want to Google Wells Gardner, it's going to come up, and that's what's one of the things on one of their pages. So, so I just thought we'd spend a little time talking about the radios themselves. So uh, Greg's on the left and mine on the right look all identical at a glance, but you find out that uh, his is a 9-tube, mine's an 11-tube. Certainly the front uh, treatment is identical. Greg's has got this schnazzy band of of uh, veneer in here that this one doesn't. This little relief on the top or molding is different. Three bars here, four bars there. A step up in the front here, whoops. Um, uh, no step up on the top, front here. Just a bunch of subtle differences. And that's part of that 43 models that they did. And the difference in the tubes is just in the audio section. I've got a push-pull audio amp with an extra driver tube and he doesn't. Uh, the frequencies are the same, electric tuning, um, Greg may be able to tell us later if there's a, uh, if he's got the, uh, the projectotone flare bell, which is basically a big piece of sheet metal that looks like a bell that the, that the uh, speaker is bolted to to make it look bigger. I don't know if it sounded any better. Uh, so, uh, and when looking it up, these came eight or 10 inch. I don't know which one he's got. Mine has a 10 inch with this, like I said, this flare bell feature. And these were one of the models that was strappable for dual voltage. And then here's one of the bigger gorillas. This is a 13 tube. And this the reason I talked about earlier, the 1939, is it was in the fall winter catalog, which overlapped into 39, but they didn't introduce any new models from what I can tell in 39. And this one, they just did the tube game again. This one went to uh, four 6F6s in push-pull parallel. And... Uh, I would say styling wise, much less attractive in my opinion, uh, bumped it up to a 12 inch speaker on a 20 inch flared metal bell and 115 volts only. So uh, like I said, the mutations that we started getting all these things next to each other, uh, it, it's gonna be just keep multiplying and multiplying. But again, the way Wells Gardner did it, it was very economical for them to make variations for wards or anybody else uh, with, uh, on these chassis. So that is what I've got. And uh, this little shot right here of the spare bulb that's in the back of the radio. It's a spare movie dial lamp here. And that's a standard automotive bulb from the time. It's a six volt uh, uh, lamp, which are readily available, fortunately. And uh, that's what I've got. So I'm going to stop sharing so Greg can share real quick.
if that's okay with everybody. Well, this is actually the radio that you saw in, in Tom's presentation, the one where he has the round dial, and this is the, the movie dial. And I'm going to try to turn this thing on. Let me move it a little bit closer so we can get a better view of it. I'll leave the volume down so we don't get any music bleeding through, but at least you might be able to see the screen. And it's, it's a lot clearer, obviously, in, in this, rather than taking a picture of it. But basically, you know, you, you tune and the, and the cylinder rotates around like this. And then if you want to change bands, that's this knob here. And you can see how the, the dial moves up and down for the different bands. I think this is the police band. And then we've got the short wave. And it's hard to tell, but they do actually change color. This one is more yellow and this one's more blue or gray. As your broadcast band again. So on the short wave band, it looks like they did on a lot of radios of the day where they have which country should be broadcasting at which frequency, right? Right. Yeah. And then the other thing, Greg, if you got real quick, is those two little indicators on the left and right of the band. Oh yeah, this is for your volume. When you turn the volume up and down, this little slider goes up and down. And this one is for your tone control. That one I can probably show you because it won't affect the sound if you can see a little arrow moving up and down might be kind of hard but it was just a gimmick it's not really going to help you tune the radio any better but looks kind of neat all right greg well, that's excellent thank you sure and he asked about the the speaker in my council i think that i have the 10 inch i don't believe i have that bell housing though in mind well, that's, that's great. Tom, that was an excellent presentation. And, and Greg, thank for, thanks for your contributions to Tom's <clears throat> presentation. And uh, are there any questions for, for Tom? For yeah. Tom, Tom, can you put the, uh, you said something about the World Radio site. Can you put that uh, site on the, in the chat? It's already there. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go take a look. Yeah, the chat, the... Uh... The, uh, the, the, actually, it's a link to that brochure, but you can get the core thing out of there. Uh, so, the, yeah, before the, 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 the meeting started, I, I uh, loaded all that stuff up there. Oh, okay. Worldhistory.com, archives, et cetera, et cetera. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, world, worldradiohistory.com or whatever it is is all you need to get to. There's just a wealth of stuff on there. Yeah, Tom, that was an awesome presentation. The amount of research you did there was... Uh... Pretty impressive, and uh, you've you've done a great service to radio collectors everywhere with that information. I might comment on uh, the chrome-plated chassis on those. Um, I I have one here that uh, when I first got it, uh, it looked pretty rough uh, with rust, and uh, I, for the heck of it, I said I'm just going to take Gojo and a popsicle stick and start massaging the uh, the chrome plate. And it went from being like a three or four to a seven or eight. Um, um, it was a dramatic improvement on just something as simple as that. And, and I think it's because uh, at a microscopic level, the, uh, the chrome, um, has fissures in it and the rust when it forms it actually grows up and spreads over the crack to to uh and spread out on the surface so that uh it, it covers up more than you think of the of the good plate so uh if if you've never tried that on those uh movie dial chrome plated chassis you you got you don't have much to lose by trying it. I've got a question. Has anybody ever tried to touch up the 35 millimeter film strip if they get all scratched or faded or have any tips? I have not, but there's actually a, a person on YouTube. I think he goes by the name of Glass Slinger. And he restored a movie dial recently. And he actually reprinted the film strip. I don't know how he did it. But he uh, recreated a new one because his was just about gone. And uh, you might want to look that up on uh, YouTube because that would 
probably be the only way I would know how to touch one up. Because the 35 millimeter film, it's either good or bad. There's really, really no way to, to salvage it. Yeah, in that in that video, he printed it on a uh, <clears throat> on a computer printer, and then he had to lacquer it or something to keep the uh, image from right. fading, as I recall. The uh, some fifteen years ago, there was a guy that was making um, uh, real uh, uh, film negatives, if you will, using uh, the real deal, but he he was charging a ridiculous price. And uh, I, he was around for a year or two and then went away. Uh, but so somewhere out there, there is a actually very good artwork for that. He, his uh, his dials were uh, essentially perfect, but uh, it's been a long time since I've heard anything about him. Okay. Any further questions for Tom on his movie dial? Okay, then. And it's time for our next presentation. And I'll introduce the presenter, and that's me. So I'll just get right into it. I'm going to talk about uh, a restoration I did about, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, uh, a Grundig radio, and how I used the internet at the time to help me figure things out. So let me share my screen. OK. This radio, I don't know how to say the word Druckstast, and maybe some of you German speakers out there could educate me. But um, this is a 57E push button boy radio. And it's uh, the story basically is uh, how I restored it. And the, this is based on an article I wrote for the Colorado newsletter and the Archie newsletter. In, uh, in the past. So this, this radio, uh, Stasten means push buttons. And so this is the push button boy 57E and it was made in 1956. You can see that really cool advertisement there. Um, talks about, uh, super as a adjective there. And that's, that's really cool the way they did that. And this little radio is pretty small. It's, it's only about 10 and a half inches wide, as you can see there by the dimensions. And it's got four different AM bands, standard broadcast and, and some shortwave bands. It's got four tubes in it and two selenium rectifiers. And it weighs about seven pounds with all the original batteries in it. You can kind of see what's inside there with the back open. And uh, it's, re it's really crammed in there. And the, to handle changing from all the different mains voltages, they had this uh, little box here with the uh, threaded uh, screws that would go in there and make the connection. So you would, based on this little instruction here in, in red ink, you would put these threaded knobs in there and, and set the voltage. It also has uh, battery operation since it's a portable and the 90 volt battery went, went here in this uh, dotted area, but I didn't have one when I found this thing. And then you had three choices for powering the filaments of the tubes. You had this hardwired NICAD here, this, this yellow and blue uh, rectangular thing here. You could put a standard D cell in this area here or you could hook this up to a six volt car battery to either run it or charge the NICAD. And that jack is up here on the top. And that, that's kind of an unusual arrangement. There's some other unique things about this. Um, it's got a really nice smooth vernier dial, but it's labeled in meters. Now, some of you radio amateurs may not have problems with that, but when I see that stuff, it's, it's kind of confusing to me. Um, so I think it was a little awkward for the US market to have it that way, but that's the way they did it. Uh, it's got a three foot telescoping antenna, plus an antenna jack, and there's a loop stick on the inside. So this is what it looked like when I 
found this thing in a secondhand store. It was actually in pretty good shape. It was really dirty. And uh, here's a picture of it with the guts removed. One tube was missing. But the really nasty part was the ferrite loop stick was hanging by one or two wires and most of the other wires were disconnected. So that was, that was kind of ugly. Uh, the 90 volt battery was gone, as I mentioned, as was the D cell. And the NICAD was very corroded and lots of uh, fuzzy corrosion on it. So the first thing I had to do is figure out what the model number was. And I went to radiomuseum.org, which is a great place to go. And I had a photo gallery and showed me what the tubes were and showed me that I didn't have the right tubes in there. I had US versions of the European tubes. And then I found a site in France where a fellow restorer had restored one of these things. And he had a little bit of information there and he had a schematic, and, uh, but it was in French. And so part of this presentation is about how I learned to use Google Translate, which back in, when I first wrote this article, it was, it was a new thing to me. And, and now it's maybe a little bit easier for many people, but I learned how to use Google Translate. And so I had a schematic and I could read the text that this guy wrote about it and it was great. Now here's a picture of the guy's website in French. And after you ask your browser to translate it, it comes up in English. So that helped me out a lot, but I still didn't understand how I was gonna hook up the loop stick because the schematic, while it was helpful, just showed the loop stick as this. And that's, that's pretty daunting if, if you're trying to restore a radio when you don't know exactly where the connection points are and which component is which, and plus it was crammed in there very, very tightly. So um, the other thing I want to point out about this schematic is it's, it's actually pretty easy to read, even though it's a European style schematic. You can kind of figure out what the resistors are and capacitors obviously look the same. And you know some of the resistors look like this with the squiggly lines. And, um, and this particular schematic has got German, French, and English on it. So I wanted to learn some things and I learned that Stutzpunkt means socket point. And I thought at the time that that would make a great name for a punk band. You know, that, you know, maybe not. Um, so this, this schematic had some weird symbols on it that I'd never really understood before. Like this one here with the X in it. I thought that was a switch initially, but it turns out that's an indicator. So I had the knowledge, I had the schematic, so I decided to start testing this thing. So I had to kind of take it all apart to, uh, to do this testing. And when I opened it up, I realized I better disconnect the NICAD battery because it was pretty shot. And I pulled out the tubes and I used my Variac and I brought up the main spower and I didn't get any smoke, which was great. But the high voltage that went to the place of the tubes was only about 50 volts. And so I knew that was a problem because the schematic said it needed to be 85. And the other problem was the filaments are about one and a half volts for these tubes and it was reading about seven volts. And it turns out that NICAD battery needs to be in the circuit to keep that voltage down around one and a half volts. So I had to fix a couple things and I was able to isolate the, the short on the high voltage B plus to a capacitor on the plate that was mildly shorted and fixed that and I got the B plus going, but I still had to worry about what to do about the one and a half volts before I could apply power to the filaments. So I just hooked up a small DC power supply to the filaments and I put in the American equivalents for the tubes I didn't have. And I took my signal generator and I injected an AM signal at the, the grid of the RF tube. And I got that tone to come out the speaker. So I knew I had somewhat of a radio there. So that was very cool. But what I didn't have was the loop stick hooked up. And so nothing was tuned and I couldn't really get any signals from the, from the atmosphere. So I was really clueless at this point how to hook that loop stick up. So I went and ordered the tubes and 
I started recapping the whole radio and replacing the, all the, the capacitors. And then I uh, ordered, I said I ordered the tubes and then I uh, had to come up with a filament regular. So I did that. I, I decided I wasn't gonna try to make this thing run on 90 volt batteries or build up a replica. So I decided it's just gonna run off the mains. And I thought I would leave this rectangular back battery in there because it looked pretty cool. And so I came up with a uh, little regulator circuit, a low dropout regulator. And I put it on this little circuit board and I stashed it in there and kind of hid it in there. And this took the, the seven or so volts and knocked it down to one and a half volts. So with that, I got the thing to work uh, without using a power supply for the phones. So my idea was then to go contact this guy who has this great website. You should check it out. His name was Pierre. And I, I decided he had a contact button, so I'd send him an email. But I needed to send it in French because the website was in French. So I used Google Translate, which I think uh, Robert Lozier had alluded to using that in his research a few presentations ago. And that's what I use. I, I typed up my letter, I put it into Google Translate, I translated it backwards, and uh, it sort of made sense. And I also took French in high school, so I had sort of a clue what I was doing. But I sent him off a message for help and I explained what I was doing. And the next day I got an answer back in French and it was great. So I pumped it through Google Translate because I couldn't read it in French, even though I was supposed to. And he said this, he sent this great diagram that said, here's how you hook it up. And he showed me where all the connection points were on the little top of the chassis. And I thanked him and he, he wanted a label that he could reproduce for his restoration. And uh, a few more emails and, and trying to figure out how to wind the coil, number of turns and all that stuff on the, on the turns that were missing, I had it working. And there's the loop stick. So you can see it's kind of a, a daunting task to try to connect that up without knowing what point to connect it to. They got you had all these tabs there and all these wires to hook up to it. So it was a success. So then I went, had to clean it up, and I was missing the brass nose cone for this main tuning knob. So I found this knob in my junk box and it became a donor. I glued that on there. I, I took some gold paint and filled in the, the crack there. One interesting thing about the front of this radio is each one of these little brass strips is actually a piece of brass. It's not paint or printing or anything. It's a, it's a piece of very thin brass. And so it's, it's pretty classy looking. So I took a few pictures. I sent them off to this guy, Pierre, and I thanked him and he congratulated me on the effort. And I felt really great about this. This was, for me, it was an exciting thing to go restore something with some help from somebody in another land. So after I restored it, I found this great repository of European uh, radio schematics and model numbers. And I'll show you here how you can use Google Translate. And this on this site, you can find all of Grundig's schematics. And What's really interesting about this is the Grundig people, not, they didn't just have a push button boy, they had all of these boys in here. I mean, look at all those names. They, they really milked this to death. But these were all radios that, that you can find on this website. And uh, I thought that was fascinating. So, so you can go to this, um, this website here. So this is after I translate. And so you've got this, this great collection of schematics. And let me go back real quick to, to this schematic. And so th this, this is what comes up when you click that second link and you get all these radios. I mean, there's just all the Grundig radios. And if, and if you want to translate this on a Macintosh, you just go up to this header here and you just say translate to English. And so the names all of a sudden uh, get translated over. Well, anyway, uh, 
you can see here that you can get all kinds of advertisements and stuff. It's it's kind of like world radio history in a way that Tom was looking at before. But it hasn't translated it for me. Oh, there it is. It's in English now. Circuit diagrams, documents, and you can look at all the, the brand names and things. And it's got pictures. So if you have any uh, European radios or even US radios, you can go to the site and pick this stuff up. So that's my presentation for today. Thank you. And um, if you have any questions, I'll entertain them now. Tom, could you put those links in the chat? I will do that. I will do that. As soon as we get the next presenter going here, I'll put those links in the chat. Yeah, regarding uh, translations there, uh, the first thing I would suggest is uh, if you have a foreign uh, radio is to do your initial uh, web search on Google, uh, uh, putting your query into uh, the language and you'll get a whole lot more relevant hits that way than uh, trying an English search on Google. Uh, Tom, you mentioned uh, having some American equivalent tubes. Do the Europeans now uh, have the same bases that uh, we've got on our tubes? It seems to me in the past uh, they had some odd layouts and things like that. And uh, just wondered, are there now pretty standardized on 8-pin, 7-pin, 9-pin miniatures? Well, uh, those miniature tubes in that radio were all 7-pin miniatures, and they, they had functional equivalents. So uh, that's all I can speak to from that era. There, there were obviously able to swap back and forth and, you know, they worked. Um, I know that there were Russian versions of seven pin miniatures where they were equivalent to uh, US twos, but then they had variants that uh, uh, they'll just have the, uh, the Russian number on there and uh, they're not the same kettle of fish, uh, so. Okay. Thank you uh, for, for those questions and Robert for your additions. Uh, any other questions? We'll move on to our next presenter, Jeff Benoyer. Jeff's gonna speak about some of the restoration challenges that he's faced. Jeff? Yeah, hi guys. So I, I, I met with Matt, I, I agreed to do a presentation and, uh, and I talked with Matt and I had some ideas that, you know, I think about just like you guys were showing, I think it's wonderful. You're showing these these radios that are very different, and and you come up with unique challenges every time, and and I think that's what makes it fun. Um, so I just call this one miscellaneous challenges that many of us face. I, I did break a rule. I realized this. I didn't know the, I didn't know the rules before this. Um, I do reference a YouTube video on here, so um, I do give the gentleman full credit for his work, uh, but hopefully that's okay, and we'll see how it goes. Um, in fact, down here, I have the, the video. I'm going to send you guys a presentation. Here's the actual video of what this guy's doing with um, crystal crystal cartridges. So crystal photo cartridges, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've restored several, um, you know, 30s, 40s phonographs. And, of course, you always get in there and you find out that the, the crystal cartridge isn't, doesn't work, right? And you wonder, what are you going to do about that? And, and I've gone and... Um, you know, I go to the VM audio, I go to the different guys and I'll buy a magnetic cartridge or a cartridge that's supposed to be a replacement. And of course, magnetic cartridges don't put out enough voltage and they, you need preamps for those, right? So when you put those in these phonographs, they don't work right. Um, and of course they have to be 78, right? They're a different, different needle. And then you can't use the other kind of needle for it either. So, you know, most of the earlier um, photographs had these crystal cartridges. Now, 80 years later, they don't work anymore, right? Uh, so what do you do? You find replacements, as I was talking about, and they don't work. So the, the old cartridges, they contain red shell salts. And I have, you know, I get into the chemistry a little bit. There's sodium potassium tartrate. And they have piezoelectric properties. 
The problem is where shelf sorts are, hy are hygroscopic. They, in other words, they love, they love to pick up water. They pick up moisture over time. And even though they're in that sealed cartridge over 80 years, I guess it's eventually going to happen, right? And then they, they lose that structure. They're not the crystalline structure anymore. So they're not piezoelectric anymore. And it doesn't work, right? Um, and of course, the crystals in there translate mechanical vibration into electrical signal. That's a piezoelectric is. Um, and so what I, I, I started to do, you know, I, I'd say even back then, I drill out the rivets and open them up and see what's in there. And, and generally, it was a mess. You see a flat crystal sheet. It's on this uh, structure, and it just looks ugly, right? So um, this is the YouTube reference. And the gentleman out there did a, um, a, an article on how to restore these. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. And the thing I found out was it really is pretty easy. Um, so I took some screenshots of what he did. I have some screenshots of my stuff. It's kind of mixed up here. Um, and it's cheap, too, to, to do it. It's relatively cheap to, to restore these. So you go in, you drill out the rivets. You got to be careful. So the cartridges are, it's like, they, the guy in the video says they're aluminum. I, I think a lot of them are pot metal. We all love pot metal, right? Um, you drill these out. If you if you don't do it carefully, you're going to break them. Um, I just use a high speed Dremel drill bit and I ever so carefully drill out the rivets. Gently pry it apart, pull everything out. Um, you got to save the rod that transfers the mechanical vibration of the crystal. And and a little research I found out that's called the yoke and the cantilever. So that's what this is down here. And um, he's prying this thing out. And you can see it's got rubber on here, old rubber. Uh, and that's the other problem with these is they have rubber in them that gets hard and brittle and it doesn't transfer the mechanical energy from the needle to the cartridge anymore. So that's another reason they don't work. Um, so you got to remove the old, uh, the old rubber from this. Um, I just use a screwdriver. I take my Dremel and have a little um, wire wheel on there. I clean it up really nice. Um, and then you cut a piece, a piece of the Scotch insulating putty to fit on the top and the bottom. And I have a picture of what this stuff is later, if you guys don't know. Um, and you, you basically create, um, you, you give the yoke and cantilever compliance, the ability to move. And you can see he's done this. That's exactly the way it looked when I did it. You wrapped a little bit of that rubbery stuff around there. You now you close the cartridge by hand. You see when you got little edges here and you cut those off with a scalpel or a razor blade and you got that down. And this, this stuff, this is the most expensive thing. It costs 17 bucks for a roll of this. But of course, you know, I used about, you know, one, one inch worth of it uh, so we could share. If, if you guys want any, I can, I can give it to you if you want to try this. So then when you, it, it's going to look like when it's done, on the left side there, you close the cartridge, you can see it's right in the middle and it's got that rubbery stuff around it. So now it can, it can vibrate, it can move around. And you take this, inex what you do is you buy these inexp inexpensive piezo crystals. I bought these on Amazon. I got a few different sizes. I played around them. They're cheap. Here it was. They said, oh, a pack of 15 of them was $7. And so you put this and you lay this in here. And, you, and this is what I did too. I just took a pencil. I marked this down here. And you take scissors and you cut this off. And the interesting thing is you think, oh, you destroy the integrity of this. It's not going to work anymore. No, it still does. That's the amazing thing. Of course, you don't cut these wires. Those are the connections for you that you're gonna use. Um, this guy did this and I did it too. I took an old CD case and you use the clear plastic front. He used scissors to cut out these pieces. I don't like doing that because it, it really messed up the plastic. They had all, all kinds of ridges in it. And um, I used my Dremel on this too. And I carefully cut out little pieces and you mount these uh, between the crystal and that cantilever yoke thing. So it looks like this on the right. And you end up with this mounted thing. He used Gorilla Glue. Um, gorilla Glue, of course, you guys know you got to be careful with because it expands and fills entire areas with things. I used, um, I think I used, uh, I used stuff. We call it Shugu. It's a, it's a more resilient material. Um, I use it for everything. I love Shugu. And I forget what they even call it now. Different names for it. Um, yeah. So now you can assemble your cartridge, and this is what the final thing looks like. You know, you, you know, make sure you got clearance around everything. Then actually underneath this, it doesn't show it here, 
um, underneath the crystal on this side, you're going to have a little piece of that, that rubber stuff again. Uh, so that, you know, it's, it's resilient. It's not touching the sides and it's night and it's clamped in here into this yoke and cantilever and you got your wires coming out the back. And really what I just said, you know, once you connect these up to the final connector in the back, it worked great and it puts out the right voltage. In fact, I have some I show here. So this is one I rebuilt. Um, I had to find, you have to find the right small, tiny nuts and bolts to hold this thing together. I had some in brass. You buy, these are the things you buy, these piezoelectric things. Again, all these cost like $7. And this is the scotch fill stuff that I use for this, electrical insulation putty. Um, so I did a little more research on this because I always wondered, what's the difference between crystal and ceramic? Because you hear guys talking about ceramic cartridges, crystal cartridges, are they really the same thing? They are in the respect that they're piezoelectric, right? They're using, they're not using a magnetic, they're not using um, a coil of wire and a magnet, they're not using, they're, they're using piezoelectric elements. Uh, the crystal uses for a shell salts. It has a pretty high output. You don't need a preamp, it's one to four volts. And I actually prove this to myself, I'll show you in a minute. Um, the ceramic uses modern, I looked this up, ceramic tit titanates, barium and lead titanates as piezo elements. Those are resistant to moisture. In fact, even after the 30s and 40s, they, when they made cheap phonographs, like you get some for your kids, the, those other kinds, they might have some more modern ceramic cartridges in them. Uh, these need a preamp though. They're not as quite a high a voltage that come out as the original Rochelle, the Rochelle salts or these piezo elements I was showing you. And I had some internet sources in here on the research I did to read about this. If you want to read about the chemistry, you want to read about how all this stuff works, it's all in here. Um, I hooked up one of these piezo elements um, and I put it on, I had this massage vibrator. I wanted to see how much vibration energy they transmit into one of these, into one of these guys here. And I, I was actually able to get six volts AC out of one of these things. So that's telling me that, you know, these things are, they're putting out the kind of voltage that the original uh, Rochelle salts did in these ceramic cartridges. So that was a ceramic cartridge one. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to had problems with those or you're trying to replace them. This is easy to do and it's not that expensive. Um, okay, next topic. Philco Bake Lake Condenser Blocks. I know I wish I could see you guys raise your hand and say how many guys have dealt with these. I'm assuming, yeah, raise your hands for me. I can see a few of you guys. And at first you see these, I got to say, the first Philco, old Philco I opened up, I'm a Zenith guy. Most of the things I rebuild are Zenith. And of course, in Zenith, the, the bugaboo in Zenith are the rubber wiring uh, that goes in everything. In Philco's, it's these things. And at first, I didn't even know what these things were. Um, and then realized, of course, when I started tracing the schematics, I'm like, there's got to be capacitors in here. And sure enough. So anybody restoring 30s Philco's. Uh, has these. In fact, I saw Gary was on the phone, on the phone, on the call before. I don't know if he's still on or not. Um, I just got an old Philco from Gary uh, to rebuild for my son. It's a cathedral. And it had, I think it had four of these in there. I could go into it later. Some folks are reluctant to rebuild them. It's really easy. In fact, it's kind of fun. I like it. <laughs> I think it's perverted pleasure. Um, you, all you need is a heat gun and a screwdriver. You don't need much. Um, I slowly heat the unit throughout. I, I, put a, I put a screwdriver for the little hole in there. I warm it up with the heat gun. You got to be careful not to heat it up too much because you, the bake light will start to crack and, and start to fizzle, and you don't want that. But if you slowly heat it up, you can gently pry the capacitors out and get the rest of the tar out of the inside of those. And you can get them really clean with just a screwdriver. Uh, some guys I was reading, they'll, they'll use solvents and clean them out. I never, I never needed to do that. I just use a small screwdriver and scrape everything out. And this is what it looks like, right? You look on the bottom. Um, you know, this bottom one, this is one of my own pictures, uh, one of the ones I opened up. And, of course, you know, you replace these capacitors in here with modern ones. They're nice and small, and they fit in. And you don't need to pot. You don't need to put tar back in there again. You don't need to do anything because, of course, these capacitors are well sealed. And when you turn this thing back upside down and mount it on the chassis, you can't tell anybody ever touched it. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it works out pretty well. I found a nice article on the internet about this. Um, I, I put the URL there. 
The most difficult part of this for me has always been identifying the connections and the correct capacitors to use because there's so many different sources on the internet and sometimes you have to translate, right? And of course, I use my schematic to figure out what the supposed capacitors are. Uh, one of the tricky things I found out early on with these is they often use the unused lugs as terminal strips. So instead of putting terminal strips in the radio, they use unused lugs on these capacitors and you think, oh, it's hooked up to the capacitor in this big light block and the answer is it's not. So especially when you get these that are like, uh, let's see, I have a picture. Yeah, like this, this schematic one at the top that has all these lugs on it. They might use two, three or four of these. The rest of them they're gonna use, excuse me, as a terminal strip. So a little trickiness you gotta be careful of. And I, I, whenever I'm restoring these, I, you guys are probably doing it now. I take lots of pictures with my iPhone. Um, I make sure all the connections are marked because I don't wanna take a chance on messing anything up. So this is the, this is the Philco Model 66. This is the one I, I, I got from uh, Gary. And you can see, you look down in here, I put arrows on where all these Bakelite blocks are. There's one, there's two. There's one buried under here somewhere. Uh, there was another one I thought. Oh, here it is here, I marked it. Couldn't even see it, right here. And the interesting thing on this one is, most of these just have a single capacitor in them. It's not even like multiple capacitors. It's, you know, why they did it this way, I'm not really sure. But they didn't have to use terminal strips. They can mount these to the chassis. Maybe that's why. So you look at these, and you got to figure out which ones they are. So this is a, this I got from Radio Museum. You can see it on here. Um, I marked on here where the four Bakelite blocks were. And then they got these model numbers on them, you know, 3903AB and so on. Um, you know, I had to go into a couple different sources to figure out which ones were which and then what they are, right? So if you look at one of these and say, okay, I've got an 8035B, I did a translation I found uh, on the internet source, that's also the 8035 ODG is equivalent. And so this has got two, can, two capacitors in it and a 0.001, right? And it tells you what they're wired to and it gives you a schematic. And so you can rebuild it and you can put those caps inside and so on and so forth. So the hardest thing for me a lot of times is finding out whatever they say they are here or they're, they're stamped on the side of these, right? Most of the time um, is what is actually in there. And of course you use your schematic and you use the various internet sources to figure this out. Um, so here's where I had the four of these um, and you can see um, there's only a couple cases like right here, there was two, the two capacitors inside here was only one, here was one, here was one. Um, of course, you got to be careful with this when it goes across the line, right? So you got to use the right capacitor for that. Uh, the safety caps, you got to use for that. Um, what did I do this one? Um, oh, this is something else. Okay, so this was, um, that's just a little bit on those. And I got some, I got some files. I don't know if I get the internet sources here. Uh, let's see. No, I got a bunch of files that have translations on this uh, for all these different kinds of bake lake uh, caps. Would you guys be interested in that and seeing the, the, all the different files I found on how to, how to uh, what the right capacitors are for this? You guys are pretty much all on mute. I don't know if anybody's. Yeah, there. you know, you could, you could put that stuff in the chat window, Jeff. That would be great. Okay. Um, cause there's all these different internet sources and, and I found some, many times I got to use three or four of them to, to get the right translations to tell me what's inside that Bakelite block. So that's the second fun topic for me. I love some of this unique stuff in radio. In fact, I love the thing about movie dial radios. I mean, stuff like that, rebuilding Grundigs and farm radios is, wow, <laughs> challenge. Um, here's another one, Bluetooth conversion. So, I mean, a lot of us are purists. We don't like to do this. We hate when other guys do it. Um, you know, wh what I found is I found a minimally invasive way to do this. And so that if somebody says, I got to sell the radio to somebody and they say, oh, I'm a purist, I don't want this in here. In five minutes, I can take it out. So in general, 
you, you know, you're, this is about where you're going to want to tie into. So I tied into this. This is the Philco 66 I was talking about. And I tied, I tied in right here. And what do I do? I put in a double pole, double throw switch in there. And I switched the, um, of course, I switched the hot lead. I also switched the ground in there because, of course, I used um, grounded, grounded cable to, to tie this into my Bluetooth and then tie this back into the radio from the switch. And I got a picture of it later. But you're going to want to go in here somewhere. And the thing, of course, you got to make sure you're not going to get any hum. And the other, the other problem is sometimes, in my case, I got interference from the switching power supply that runs the Bluetooth device. Um, so I had to make sure I grounded this the right way so I didn't have that interference in there. And that was some fun figuring that out. Like, where's this interference coming from? Of course, I'm in ham radio, so I know all about these problems with switching power supplies. So I'm like, it's gotta be coming from this. And sure enough, I unplugged it and it went away. Um, so this is it right here. So you can see, I, you know, I just hooked in here. This is a, of course, a, a shielded cable. Um, I switched both hot and ground. Because what I found was when I had that ground, I said, oh, it's ground, who cares, right? It's all ground. It was the ground that was bringing in that noise from the switching power supply into the radio. And once I switched ground as well, it, it went away. So that's all I had. So that's the invasion in the radio. That's it. That's all there is to it. So I could take this radio apart. I could just clip, I could just clip these two wires and it would be just like it was originally. You know, so if you ever wanted to go back. Um, here's the Bluetooth device mounted inside the radio and the various wires. What I did was I actually put a, I took an extension cord, you can't see it here. And I, and I, there I, use, there I use some of my shoe goo. I used a screw on the top of the extension cord too. But I, I glue, basically glued that into the cabinet. The nice thing with that shoe goo stuff is you can usually pry it off anything and it doesn't destroy it. It's very strong and it's slightly flexible, but you can get it off without destroying things. One of the reasons I love it. But you put this in here. And you see, I got my radio wire, which I put a new, a new, a new course, a new wire on it, and I have it plugged into this extension cord thing. I also have the switching power supply for the Bluetooth device in here, and then of course I added a switch on the radio. This is the picture of the, the radio itself. This is the Bluetooth device, and then another slide. I, I show you what it is. Maybe the next one. No. Oh, this is where I, I messed up. My bad. This is. Switching back, this was a slide that meant to go somewhere else where I, when I took that piezo element that I rebuilt the cartridges with, it gave me six volts. If you look at on the six volt AC setting on my old uh, Radio Shack meter here, and I got six volts when I put this on a massage device. Um, I also put it on, it's interesting, I put it on an oscilloscope, um, it showed the same thing, and it gave me a perfect sine wave. It was pretty cool. Sorry, the slide's in the wrong place. I don't know how it ended up there. Here's the Bluetooth device. Um, you know, I mounted in the cabinet along with this power supply. Like I said, it works great. 22 bucks. And part of the reason I like doing Bluetooth now is because probably like you guys, I've tried like four or five different AM transmitters to transmit in my radio. I don't like any of them. None of them work well for me. Um, I, you know, I even have one, I think it was called like Talking House. It was a, it's a nice big unit. I bought it on eBay. It's supposed to be real estate agents used to use it to broadcast out to your car if you're looking at somebody's house that was for sale and they could tell you all about it. Um, even that one, didn't, it doesn't work very well for me. So I do this. I Bluetooth in with my phone. I play any music I want into the radio. It sounds great. $22. Um, okay, so that is that is all I have. Oh, I hear. I have it in the presentation. So if um, Tom, if you if you actually post the presentation itself, these files are embedded in the presentation. Okay. So if, so if you double click on any of these, um, you know it'll fire up. Like if I double click on this one, it'll fire up the um, the PDF file that tells you about all this stuff about your capacitors and so on. Okay. Uh, let me go back. So that I think is uh, is all I have. Yeah. Any, any questions? Jeff, not, not a question. Um, I, uh, am I, okay. I think I'm off mute. Not a question. I found my, uh, some, uh, 
my shoe go. It's not focusing. It's not, it's not in focus. Yeah, yeah. Because you have a yeah. background. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's it's it used to be called Shugu, and then they come up with um, it's this it's this um, well, some of you guys remember Duco Cement, right? From when we were young, <laughs> it's kind of like Duco Cement, but it's got this 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 rubbery. There we go, Shugu. That's the original stuff. Yeah, that's the original stuff. But there's other stuff you can buy at Home Depot, and it's very similar to this. Yeah, and the reason they called it Shugu is because if you have the, if, if the heel of your shoe comes off or the, the sole comes off, yeah. this stuff is. Awesome for putting it back together again. You clamp it overnight and the shoe stays together for another year. You got your shoes. That's what I started using it for. I use it for everything in radio. I I, I mount components with it. it. It's it's great stuff. And like I said, if you ever change your mind, you can you can gently pry it off. It comes off, but it stay on forever other than that. Thanks, Ed. Wouldn't, wouldn't Velcro command strip also work for that? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you could. Yeah, Velcro is a good idea. Like for that, the Bluetooth unit, you could. Yeah, you could use the Velcro and Velcro it on. Sure. Um, I'm just used to using this other stuff. Yeah, good idea. I've seen uh, back to your phono uh, pickups. Uh, Seventeen dollars for a uh, uh, a 3M material that uh, I won't use anywhere else. But yeah. uh, I've thought about taking a uh, nitrile glove and just cutting strips and wrapping that around your uh, sure. piece there. I don't know if, if that's a good use, but uh, uh, in my next lifetime, I think I want to try that. Yeah, great idea. I mean, anything that's going to that's going to leave that thing compliant so it can vibrate and it's not going to degrade in a, a year or two. Hey, yeah, sure. Give it a go. That's great. Well, with regards to your Philco uh, condenser blocks, I just did a Philco Model 9. It had eight or nine of those things in there. I was able to change the caps and all without taking a single wire off. And I used these uh, tools. I showed them one other time. And one is just a poker and one is a little screw, a, a little drill bit on a screwdriver. Oh, there we go. And uh, what you do is you, you break the eyelets where the little lead comes through, you leave it leave it bolted down, and then you heat it up all the way around. You poke through till it hits the bottom. You'll, you'll actually hear the, the solid piece of you know, uh, potting material hit the bottom of the chassis, and you unbolt it, and you can push it out the rest of the way with the wire still attached. Worked great. Nice. That's not nice. Cool. I, have a, I, I have a comment. This is Keith. On your 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 uh, Velcro, um, if you get the type that's got the adhesive back, if that's what you're talking about, uh, you got to remember that once it's inside the cabinet of a radio, it's going to get awful warm. The problem with the uh, adhesive back on the Velcro is it's going to get gooey and it's going to fall off, and you're just going to have a gooey mess in there uh, from that adhesive back. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, like you said, I like I like the other stuff because it, it the Hugo doesn't leave a it doesn't leave a gooey mess um, if you gently pry that off. In fact, I I've even done it where I've, I've had it on wood like that inside a radio and gently pried it off and it hasn't destroyed the surface. It's 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 pretty good stuff. So okay, well, thank you, Jeff, for that great presentation, which covered three different topics of, of great interest. Those were really cool topics. And I, I especially like the, the piezoelectric cartridge restoration. That that always looked like a daunting task, but you made it look pretty simple. Yeah, yeah. So thanks. That's Thank cool. you guys. Yeah, that, that was a great presentation. Lots of good questions, <laughs> lots of good interactions. So our last presentation today is um, by Joe Coaster, who actually is not here live today. And so what, what Matt and I did is we worked with him and we videotaped his presentation. And so the, uh, the video you're about to see is Joe presenting his part three of his uh, cabinet refinishing series. And if you have any questions for Joe, we've put his contact information in the chat window. And he said, feel free to contact him with any questions or comments. So 
without further ado, I'll get the video going here. Good morning. Uh, this is Joe Coaster, and uh, I live in Crossville, Tennessee, and through the wonders of Zoom and, and due to the uh, uh, help of Matt and Tom, uh, we're going to uh, have part three of Radio Cabinet Restoration. And this was a, an article that appeared in the uh, Mid-Atlantic Antique Radio Club's Radio Age back in 2009, and also appeared uh, more recently in the Archie newsletter. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to be live doing this. It's being recorded. So I will not be able to answer any questions uh, until after you have seen uh, the entire presentation and you'll have instructions there on how to contact me via email or telephone. And I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody has on this uh, at that point. So without further ado, we'll go into part three of Radio Cabinet Restoration. As we stated earlier, we covered pretty much everything until we, uh, until we get up here on staining, grain filling, and the final finishing. Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, some cabinets that were all done at once. And uh, we've done everything, and we're getting ready to uh, put our first coat of lacquer on. And uh, we've already done the sanding and the staining and the grain filling. And uh, before we put the final coats on, we're going to have to do a little bit of uh, graining and toning. So as I mentioned before, it's uh, the humidity needs to be less than uh, 70 percent. And the temperature should be above 45 or so degrees. So ideally, you can do it in the summer, but not when the dandelions are flying around. So staining the wood, we've done everything and we're getting ready to go. And you could pretty much use any kind of stain you want. But I, I've liked the uh, Balin. Uh, the, uh, it's a non-grain raising stain. Now, Balin may not be available anymore. So it'll, the, same, uh, the same stain is going to be under the, uh, the Mohawk label. Uh, one of the nice things about it, if you get a series of these stains, you can mix them. I like the medium brown walnut and the nutmeg, which I know are now still available under the Mohawk label. But if you want to make them a little bit redder, like uh, for mahogany or a little bit darker, you can always add a little bit of jet black or blood red, but do it in a separate container so you don't mess up a whole quart. I've had some success with, with something other than Mohawk, but honestly, for my experience, the Mohawk Balin brand has pretty much uh, become the, the standby. One of the main things to do is, is make sure that uh, the, the cabinet is clean and no more, no crud in there. So what we're, uh, we're gonna make sure is we do not have any sawdust. Now, I believe that an air compressor is a great thing to have in the shop and you get all the stuff off of it. I like to pour some of the stain into a, another container and I use a paintbrush and I work one, one area at a time. Let's just say I'm gonna work on the side of a cabinet. So I apply it to the side and I cover it real good and I let it, uh, I let it rest for just a moment. I dip a cloth in some of the stain and I wipe it down and I make sure I get all my brush marks off of it. So you, you, wanna, you wanna make sure that its surface is covered cleanly and evenly. And it may mean you do a circular motion or whatever, but you always end up moving in the direction of the grain. You don't let it run on an adjacent sur surface as it may make a, uh, uh, it may make a darker uh, stain there that's sometimes harder to clean up. So you can, you can uh, stain it first or you can uh, put the grain filler on it and then stain it. I prefer to stain it first and then put the grain filler in. As it states here, grain filler and wood filler are two different things. So don't get plastic wood and start smearing it around. You'll have a hard time with that. So understand what it is and you'll see more about that later. Grain filler, if you think of a piece of veneer, uh, it has valleys and it has hills. And this fills in the little valleys and gives you a smooth surface. One of the main things to do when you're putting any grain filler in, if it's too thick, See what the base is on it. Most of the ones I've used are uh, 
so, or a, a, a mineral spirit base. So you can take it and mix a little bit of mineral spirits with it and get a consistency, not too runny, but not thick like mud. Put it on and work it into the grain. Uh, you do not want to leave it on there too long or it's going to be like concrete. So uh, I put it on and I put it across the grain. When I put it on, I rub it in real good, use a squeegee or an old credit card, and then take it off with, after it dries, take it off about a 45 degree angle and put the old stuff back in the container. You can use it again. Now, the ones I've had uh, that I've used mostly are the Mohawk, which was called Balin before. And uh, you can see there's a can of Balin on the other side. Um, now, you can use a natural, but if you use a natural, uh, you're going to have to stain it because it has no stain in it. You're going to end up with a, a kind of a white in the pore. So that's why I like to use the, uh, the medium walnut. It may be a little darker than the actual stain I'm putting on the wood. But if you choose to use natural, then you're going to have to stain it after you put the grain filler on it. So these are these are the steps that we just talked about. And uh, once we get our grain filler in there, we're going to make sure it's all cleaned off. And there's uh, and you really want to make sure that uh, that there's uh, there's no uh, no res residual grain filler down in the uh, corners around the trim. So I use a dental pick or a, a screwdriver even, but I put a piece of cloth over it so I don't scratch anything. And once we've got it all good and clean, we want to do something to, uh, uh, to seal it. Now, some people use sanding sealer. I've, I've not really done that too much. Uh, I usually spray a, uh, uh, a one, one or two coats of, uh, of my deft lacquer on it. And uh, then I can go over it with steel wool a little bit or with some very fine sandpaper if I need to level the surface. And the nice thing of this, of using this is that this is going to lock your color and your grain filler in there. Now, this is my favorite right here. I use the, uh, the deft semi-gloss lacquer. <clears throat> I have a friend and he swears by gloss and that's fine. So whatever it is, we don't all like blondes or redheads. And uh, when I, again, <clears throat> I use the, I make sure the humidity is below 70%. I take them outside. I've got a place out there. I set up a board and uh, and I start spraying it. Now, if the humidity is is real low and the temperature is up in the 70s or 80s, uh, I can lay six or eight coats of lacquer on that radio cabinet uh, during the course of this session. So that's why it's a good idea if you're going to do this to have several radios ready and you can go out like we did in that first picture and complete a number of projects in one fell swoop. Uh, I use a little uh, <clears throat> a touch-up gun I get from Harbor Freight. It's about $30, but I've also used a, uh, a professional uh, gun that a friend gave me. And uh, <clears throat> if you've got a place where uh, you're, you're uh, uh, we talked about a green, graining marker pen or whatever. If you've, uh, if you've got a place where uh, uh, the the veneer doesn't quite match up with the other. You want to put some grain lines in it. You can get a little pen like this and you can draw it in there. You probably want to do that uh, either before you laid your first sealing coat on or before you spray a whole bunch of coats on because it's not going to transfer so good once you've got six coats of lacquer over it. There's a little gun I talked about in the back, the Harbor Freight gun. This is uh, something you usually set the pressure to around 45 pounds on your, your air compressor. And, uh, and that works very, very well. These are some of the other supplies that we talked about. The one on the left is another one from uh, Harbor Freight. And I couldn't get that puppy to work very good at all. So I like the little one you see in the center of the picture. Now the blue tape in there, that works very, very well when you're gonna do some of your, uh, your toning and what have you. Now we've we put some, usually after I put the first coat of lacquer on, uh, I want to go ahead and do some toning on it. So as you're probably familiar, most radios around the base and sometimes the upper trim or something around the top, it's going to be a slightly different color. Normally it's a darker color. 
So uh, I found that on the bottom, uh, anything from a medium dark walnut to a dark walnut or uh, a, a dark mahogany or something like that looks real good on the base. So you can use that on the base. And also you can use a little different one around the trim on the top of the radios. What you should have done to begin with though, is to take a look at the cabinet and see what it looked like originally and try to approximate it as close as you can. So uh, when we do this, we, for example, around the base, we take a, this blue tape and we go all around above the base of the radio and so we don't bleed over onto the cabinet and then take newspapers and tape them to that a little up above that blue tape, the blue tape so that whatever you spray on there, you don't get on the rest of the cabinet. You'd also do this around the top or whatever, wherever you're going to put your toning lacquer, you want to be sure to protect the adjacent finish. And remember, the toning lacquer is just like the, the, the deft lacquer a few little passes at a time rather than one real heavy one. You're going to want to get it right the way you want it, but if you lay several heavy ones on there, it's going to run. And then you're going to have to wipe it up and start all over again. Now there are some areas like this is a Zenith, uh, this is a speaker on a common Zenith chair side. And if you'll notice at the very bottom corner there under my knuckles, there's a little groove in it and there's a groove around the speaker. And we're going to do something after we've already put in our first coat of uh, our sanding sealer coat of lacquer. We're going to go ahead and highlight these areas. Now you can go get one of these little things like women use for a little brush like they use for their eyebrows. Or you can get a real fine little brush and you can get this gesso. If you notice on the cabinet, there's one of these uh, containers of small brushes like women use for, weight, for uh, makeup. Uh, that worked out pretty good. In any event, you're going to get your gesso and you're going to put it in a container and uh, then you're going to do, you're going to wet your brush and then dip it in there in water and go around here. Now, if you get outside that track, get a wet paper towel and you can wipe it off, but do it as soon as you see it because this stuff likes to stick sometimes and it can be a little harder to do. So this is what we call detailing. We do this around pieces like this or also on the grill of a radio if you're looking at a radio from the front, say a tombstone, you'll notice the inside edges of the cutouts are kind of rough. They should also be covered with this gesso because it's that's what they look like. They were either dark or black. Now the Zenith Walton set around there, they used a, a brown, but on almost all other radios, they were either a very dark brown or a black. So you're safe using black gesso. And you'll put that in there. Now, when you put this stuff down, you're going to be a little disappointed because it's going to look flat and your radio is going to have a semi-gloss finish on it. But the trick is when you shoot it with your lacquer, it turns nice and glossy, the same color as your radio. So fear not when you put that on. I mentioned the grill around the speaker. You want to get it fairly smooth. Uh, so you can go in there and just take any of the rough spots off of it with some medium, 150, 180, 220, and then you put your get your gesso in there, and it's going to really look great when you do that. So here's what I talked about on the on using uh, on using the gesso, and you keep the wet paper towels around. Now, in some radios, they have what you call a feather finish. So you'll have, uh, let's say, on the edge of a radio, say a console coming from the top up toward the uh, the, uh, the top on the front, it will be say a, a brown or a black, but it will feather out. So it, it, it's not, it, it just not a sharp contrast, but it just sort of bleeds over. And you can do that with an air gun. Uh, and, and these are really, really nice. Uh, you can use a can of uh, air like that, or you can get a little adapter and put it on your, uh, uh, your gun and turn the pressure way down, two or three pounds. You can experiment with it. And the little jar there, you mix up what you're going to do in there. And let's say that's going to be the same toning lacquer you used on your, uh, say, the edge of your radio. But now you're going to put a very fine mist of it from the edge of the radio back to the regular finish of the cabinet. And boy, that is a nice looking thing if that's what it was on your radio to begin with. I found that some of the cheaper Midwest radios did that. They would feather the finish out. Now, as I mentioned about the lacquer, about the uh, humidity 70 and all that, uh, 
that's very, very important. And here you can see several examples uh, of, a, of a good day right outside the radio shack. And uh, uh, the temperature might not have been the greatest. It was a little bit overcast, but the humidity was great. And so we had uh, seven radios that day that all got sprayed at once. One console and a couple of cathedrals and a number of tombstones. And they all turned out pretty good. And you can see right now that the uh, the toning has not been done on that. Is look at the basis of the radios, and they all match the the color of the uh, of the radio. So we haven't done that yet. I mentioned the gun, and I would say that the pressure should be forty five to sixty five pounds. And you know you're too high if when you spray that on there, you'll get something that looks like an orange peel finish. What it's doing, the air pressure is so great that it's affecting the application of the lacquer on the finish. I prefer to uh, keep do a horizontal spray. I simply can turn the gun on its side if I'm doing the, a console radio and shoot from top to bottom. And again, I also mentioned, I can't stress it too much. Uh, you can control the flow of the lacquer from your gun if you're using one of those like I talked about. So when you first load it up, shoot some lacquer into the air and look at how much is coming out of it. And if you're getting a whole bunch of them, if you're kind of new to it, turn it down. It's real nice to lay a heavy coat on, but if it's too heavy, it's going to run. So you don't want it to run because you're only causing yourself problems. It's not the end of the world, but you don't want sags or run. And I usually put six or eight coats on a radio. Now, after it's dried for a couple of days, I think somebody came up with the term outgassing which I like to do that. I take it inside in the shop because it smells good too. I love the smell of lacquer. Uh, and uh, we'll get it in there and let it dry real good. And uh, it's uh, it looks pretty good. But if you get some quad zero steel wool and very lightly go over the radio, you're going to find that even with the lacquer on there, it may be a little bumpy. It's going to be very small. You probably won't see it much, but you're going to notice a big difference. You go over it lightly with steel wool, uh, quad zero, and it's going to dull it a little bit, but it's going to smooth it out. So don't bear down too hard, especially on the edges where you're going to go through the lacquer. Now, if that happens, it's not the end of the world. Stop, clean it off, get your gun or get a can of Def Spray lacquer and spray a little bit over it, let it dry, and you're okay. But don't go through the stain if you get real hard on it, because then you're going to have to put some stain in there, and then you're going to have to do the whole thing again, not the whole radio, but hopefully you can stain it, wipe it off, let it dry, then put a little lacquer over it, you'll be all right. Now, you're going to notice some, some white residue in that steel wool, and that's the old lacquer you've taken off. Now, you can blow the steel wool out and use it until it doesn't have that compressible feeling again. It's not really too much good after that, but I still save that steel wool, and I use it when I'm stripping. But be sure you blow all the stuff out of it. So after you've gone over the radio lightly, and that's everything, that's uh, except maybe inside the speaker grill, the base, all the things you've toned and everything, wipe it off, blow it off with air, wipe it off with a clean, clean cloth. I use a towel or T-shirt. And I use some uh, stuff called antique wax. And it's a high quality furniture, furniture wax, not a polish now. The polish is going to cause other problems. Use a wax. And uh, use it on, put it on with one cloth and buff it with another, and you're going to get really good results. Okay, one last thing we're going to talk about is the fine abrasive restoration technique. And that's where we have sprayed that cabinet, and we've gone over it with our, uh, uh, our, our 220 or our 320, and we want that thing to shine like a piano. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on up to 400, 600, 1,000, and 1,500 grit. And when we get above, uh, say, 600, we're going to use a little bit of paraffin oil as a lubricant. And uh, when you get done with that thing, it's going to it's going to look like a piano. And uh, after you've done that, you can go over it with uh, fine pumice and then rotten stone. You can buy these in cabinet places. And there, uh, I've got one or two radios that have that finish on it. It takes a lot of work, but if that's what you want. That may not be what it looked like coming out of the store, but it's very pleasing to the eye. You better clean everything up. And what I do is have a paper bag and I put all the rags and everything in and I take them outside and the, then they go to the dump. Don't leave them in the house because you've got, you've got uh, old rags with uh, all sorts of 
solvents and stains and lacquer residue and whatever, and you do not want those in there. There's some of the supplies we talked about, and uh, I think you can you can find most of these. Uh, the toning lacquers are available online, or you can go to a good woodworking store, and uh, you never have too many different kinds. The uh, Van Dyke Brown is good. The medium dark walnut, extra dark walnut, perfect brown are among my favorites. That'll do pretty much anything you want to do. Don't forget your gesso. Uh, Hobby Lobby has it. Uh, you'll need black, and if you can find burnt umber, fine. If not, you can buy some acrylic paint and mix it up yourself. It comes in tubes, and that'll give you some of the browns you need. And uh, that's pretty much it. So if you have uh, any questions, you can get in touch with uh, Matt at the end of this presentation, and uh, we'll give you, he'll have a way to give you my email address and my telephone number. And I'll be glad to talk to you when I'm available. So thanks a lot for watching and happy refinishing. Well, thank you, Joe, out there in the ether. That was a great presentation from Joe. And uh, if you look in the chat window, you can see his contact information if you'd like to ask him a question or just uh, make contact with him. Well, that concludes our presentation portion of our video meeting today. And at this point, we're going to put up a poll and see if you are interested in being a presenter. It's, it's really easy to do. And uh, if, if you've never done it before, Matt and I can help you prepare slides and do that sort of thing. And uh, you're only going to have three chances this year, this calendar year, to uh, have another video meeting to present at. So, now is the time to throw your hat in the ring and say you're interested. So please uh, consider doing so. So now um, we are going to uh, enter our show and tell tips and techniques portion of our video meeting. So I noticed from the earlier poll that we have a couple of show and tells lined up. So without uh, further ado, I'll uh, ask those show and tell people to Take the floor. Well, I, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, somewhat appropriate coming after Joe's presentation because I'm just going to show my wares on cabinet restoration. Uh, I'm Stuart, Stuart Young. I'm in Cary. I'm a recent uh, member, just joined uh, recently. I'm introduced to you all in your group by Gary Bernstein. Uh, who I think has dropped, dropped off now. Uh, anyway, uh, as you well know, a beautiful cabinet completes your expert ch chassis work, uh, but not everyone has the patience or the passion for, for cabinet refinishing as you do for the uh, electronics work. So there I am. Uh, I set up a table uh, at your meeting in February and uh, had a wonderful time. I uh, gave away all 30 of my homemade business cards uh, and had some great conversations. Got actually a couple guys contact me afterwards and uh, have done a project for one guy, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and, and, you know, why have someone else do it? Well, you let you focus on your area of expertise, uh, especially if you don't enjoy woodworking and uh, hopefully a completed radio you're, you're proud to show off. Uh, I've been doing, as a, as a personal hobby, I've been doing antique furniture refishing for, for 30 years. And uh, in the last uh, few years, I've gotten connected with uh, some of your members and, and others that uh, needed me to do their cabinets for them. Uh, just a few before and afters to show my wares. Uh, and... few others that the one in the upper right hand corner I, I did for Bob who's uh, uh, who I met at the swap meet so that's some of my wares uh, I'm happy to work with you every step of the way uh, I, I'm, I, I send you photos of work in progress uh, obviously have you decide stain uh, what sort of finish uh, I, I'll, I'll say I'm not experienced with grain filler uh, I come from a 
you know, a, a fine furniture background and just a personal thing. I like to see the grain. Um, I, I like to know that it's wood and feel the wood. So uh, if, if those uh, uh, super high gloss grain filler finishes is your thing, then I'm probably not your guy. Uh, some guys have sent me photos that they found on the internet of what they would hope that their cabinet's going to look for in the end. And I try to work toward that again, depending on uh, the nature of the uh, veneers and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I typically charge about $300. I, I, I don't make a lot of money doing, uh, doing it. I mean, that's probably about $10 an hour by the time you factor in my, my time and, uh, and materials, uh, but uh, I, I enjoy it. It's, it's, I'm retired now uh, and it's, it's a hobby and I just love the, I love the transformation. I love seeing it go from what it was like before until what it was like after. Uh, and Gary gave me a nice reference. I uh, did beautiful work on two of his cabinets, worked with me on every detail, etc. cetera. And uh, that's me. I'll put my phone number uh, in the chat. If anyone wants to reach out to me, send me a picture, uh, text me a picture of your, what you need done and uh, we can go take it from there. All right, Stuart. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's, that's all part of the hobby, getting our cabinets refinished. Uh, you bring up a good point that not everyone has that ability. So that's a great service you can provide to our club members. Hi, yeah. good morning, everybody. I've got something to show and tell. Great, Marty. All right. Um, I'm in my kitchen here today, so I hope I can do this correctly. I found this week a very cool passive device called a select antenna. Check that out. <laughs> Uh, I think I found it, uh, a guy on Craigslist who ha whose office happened to be one mile from my house, so I didn't have to traverse the entire county to go find it. And what it does, of course, is it just amplifies uh, AM radio signals. I'm going to see if I can make, let you see this. <laughs> Uh, this is just a little AM radio, and it's tuned to the uh, airport information at uh, Midway. So you bring your select intent to the device near the tune. And greatly amplify the RF signal to the radio. And you move it away, you almost totally lose the signal. So it's a very cool device. And why I like it is, uh, you know, some of the radios that were restored, the tube radios aren't always very sensitive. So you put this guy next to one of your tube radios, you tune in the right frequency that you're listening to, and you get a greater signal into the radio. Very cool device. And uh, I picked it up for $20. So nice, it's a nice uh, addition to my collection. How about that? That's cool. Who, who manufactured that? Um, uh, let's see, manufactured by, so it's, a, it's a company in Hales Corners, Wisconsin, Enter Sonics Corporation. I don't know if you guys will be able to see this or not, but. That design. Okay. I might add that that design has been out there for probably 25 years. Oh, I think so. Um, uh, I have another one of these, a smaller one, that I've had in my possession for as long as I can remember, so that's a long time. <laughs> Anyhow, cool little device, nice little addition to the collection, and uh, it, actually, it actually provides a service. So uh, uh, a good buy for $20. Well, thank you, Marty. Okay, then. Well, that concludes our video meeting for today. And I'd like to thank everyone who participated and presented. So thanks again, and we'll see you in May.